you for joining us again at this end of week webinar for the Nanaimo Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is uh, week six, I believe, or seven, and uh, very happy this week to uh, pivot to the topic of health and wellness. Uh, something very important as we go uh, through the, the pandemic crisis and are starting to emerge a little bit on the other end. Um, with, with us today, I have uh, Dr. Joris Wiggers, uh, who is, and I want to get this right this time, um, medical lead for the Department of Psychiatry, Island Health, Central Island Region. I also have with us Dr. David Copeland. David is a radiologist. Uh, owner of Madrona Clinic and president of the Nanaimo Medical Engagement Society. Uh, I want to start uh, with perhaps uh, Dr. Wiggers kicking us off um, with some uh, basic background uh, and ask you to talk about uh, mental health and this being Mental Health Week, May 4th to the 10th, I believe it is, um, what that means and why we need to be especially cautious and careful and um, aware of our own mental health this time. Okay, so thank you, Kim, for uh, inviting me. And I, I would like to start by recognizing that I come to you uh, on the unceded territories of the Nanaimo people, and I'm grateful to be here. I'm an immigrant myself from the United States from many years ago, and so I come here with uh, humility and gratitude for being in such a beautiful place in the world. and the COVID crisis has pointed out clearly to me how lucky I am. And I hope it uh, continues to remain, feels like a bit of a sanctuary on our island. Um, so uh, the pandemic, um, I, I, from my perspective, I'll, I'll speak with two hats, just on the one hand, the medical lead sort of health authority, and then just personally as well. So I think that the um, uh, health authority perspective and specifically the mental health substance use division of the health authority sees the COVID pandemic as basically a third crisis. We already have two others that we've been deeply embroiled in, which is the, the opiate overdose crisis and then there's a homelessness crisis, the unsheltered people. And so I think that whatever comments I make today have to be contextualized, that we are trying to juggle three huge balls in the air at this point. Um, uh, as a, just a case in point, in March, the number of deaths from opiate overdoses exceeded by over twofold the number of COVID deaths. So truly we're still, uh, working full bore and all of the other mental health uh, demands on, on us and uh, we're over capacity and um, the, it's interesting how the COVID crisis affected us. There, there actually was an initial lull in services as we uh, shut down a little bit, locked our clinics, shifted over to virtual care and tried really hard to maintain our relationships with our clients in the community. Um, and there was a reduction in the access to our services because people were staying home and afraid of getting COVID at the hospital. I think that's, that's shifted. So we're, we, I think, as you said, Kim, the, the, we're sort of at the end of the beginning and now we're sort of entering phase two. And this is where we, we really are anticipating a huge second wave of mental health that the, uh, initial reaction to COVID was fear, this intense uh, universal reaction. And I could say personally, I felt it. I was uh, dreaming about getting COVID and being quite terrified that my family was gonna get COVID. And I have family in the United States, friends in New York City, and personally it was uh, terrifying. And so I, I think that all of us had some amount of fear um, and I think we've now shifted to this other kind of <clears throat> emotional reaction to COVID, which is, <clears throat> is anticipation, which is this low grade, constant stress, this fear that it's going to come as we've kind of made it through the first wave. And so, um, it's, it's interesting the the fear response is fight or flight, and it tends to lead to 
panic, catastrophic thinking, an expectation that, uh, uh, almost like a paranoia that you're going to be the one that gets sick. And now we shift to this anticipation, which is a totally different uh, reaction. It's actually physiologically different. We now run higher levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. We're in a state of stress, and it starts to wear down the, a person's mental and physical well-being. So we're anticipating a rise of depression, or I am, I think, and I'm seeing it already in the last two weeks. The clients who've been isolating and anticipating are starting to get more depressed and we're seeing the, the anxiety panic shift to depression and withdrawal and sort of breakdown. So what Dr. Henry's been saying about community is so, so important. So um, uh, there's more to say, but that's, those, are, those are sort of my initial comments on, on the mental health aspect of the COVID pandemic, both uh, personally health authority and then just sort of general psychiatric comments. Um, yes, I was reading um, something this morning that says that said uh, connecting doesn't just feel good, it's good for our mental health. Uh, I think that uh, was that's a quote off of mentalhealthweek.ca or else bounceback.ca uh, or sorry, bouncebackbc.ca, which I find to be a very uh, helpful website. Um, especially addressing um, uh, uh, depression in young adults and adults uh, and then advise uh, people to take a, a look at uh, bouncebackbc.ca. Quite interesting and, and very interesting in light of, of what you just said there. Uh, Dr. Copeland, um, I wonder if you could uh, do a bit of self-introduction here and talk about your experience over the last uh, 60 or so days as the pandemic has, uh, has run through our province, our country, our the globe. Thanks, Kim. And, and yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a very humbling experience the last 60 days. Uh, first of all, I just want to say with regards to yours comment, living on the island is beautiful, but it's also been strategic because in terms of COVID, because we've been very protected on the island relative to the rest of the province. Uh, and I think one of the big factors is being on this island. Uh, but, and the other thing is uh, in terms of paranoia and uh, fear, for sure, every time I coughed or I sneezed, because I've been in and out of the hospital, I thought that gee, I must have COVID, you know, and I, I didn't have to get tested because nothing was sustainable, but I have been isolated twice because of potential exposure. So, and it's very strange to go through the hospital these, the last uh, two months uh, because there's no one there. It's very quiet. Normally uh, the place is packed. We have six waiting rooms in radiology. They're usually full. You go there now, there might be one person. And of course we can't go back to those full waiting rooms. So our whole reality has changed, uh, you know, but as I said, you know, we have been lucky on the island and the stats bear that out. I mean, we have, we've only had 124 confirmed cases on the island overall. Uh, we've on, we have not had any positive tests in the last five or six days. We only have two people in hospital, one in critical care. Uh, and, you know, but we, it has taken its, our toll. We have had COVID on the island. We probably still have some COVID on the island. We've had five deaths. So, uh, it, it's a real disease with a very lethal potential. So, but again, we've been lucky because, you know, we are on the island, no ferries, no international flights, um, you know, and uh, we, we really don't have any documented community spread. So, you know, and, and that's a function of several things. I mean, island health is, and first the ministry direction has been great. Uh, we've island health and our, our uh, medical health officers on the island I've done a good job directing us. The medical staff has cooperated really well up and down the island. And, and of course, the public's been great. I mean, the most important thing is the public. And we've, we've all had to uh, go through this. And, and, and as Dr. Uh, Wicker said, it's very stressful. But, you know, we, we have been fortunate because of that. Our prevalence is very low compared to the rest of the province. And uh, uh, so there we are. Um. The numbers have been very much in our favor, obviously. Uh, but maybe a comment from you, uh, Dr. Copeland, on the fact that I believe uh, Nanaimo Regional is one of two COVID treatment centers on Vancouver Island for a population of 800,000. Uh, that seems pretty remarkable to me, that shortage of, of uh, 
of space is a, a little bit scary, I'd say. Um, first, I'll have you comment on that, and then I'll uh, pivot over to uh, Dr. Wiggers to, to talk about how, how that's impacted the mental health side of things. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, Nanaimo was a logical choice for, uh, for being one of the COVID hospitals, that the, the two, uh, Royal Jubilee is the other one, because you want to cohort these patients. You don't want to have them spread out all over and potentially spreading infection around. So and Nanaimo has the, you know, some of the tertiary services, renal in particular, that are needed to, to service uh, these patients. So, um, but on the other hand, and like everywhere else, no one was prepared for this, but uh, Vancouver Island does suffer from a shortage of critical care beds. Uh, we have the lowest number in Canada per capita, and it's especially prevalent north of the Malahat. We have nine critical care beds north of the Malahat. Victoria has probably about 39 and uh, and when you look at the province we are the lowest in the province as well uh, Vancouver Island um, the, the next comparable site so we had maybe 45 48 beds critical care beds the next comparable site with a similar population is Kelowna or interior health sorry and they had 74 critical care beds so we had like 45 and and so we were really we were worried that if we got a large pandemic with very many sick people, we would, we would have been overwhelmed quite quickly. So fortunately we weren't. And uh, good news is uh, we're hearing lots of, we have, uh, you know, this has been an issue for the last couple of years and the ministry has reached, actually reached out and identified the shortage of beds. Uh, so it's good news uh, during the pandemic, they, their figure own figures, listed us as having 39 critical care beds, which was a bit short, I think, but they realized that and, and they have reached out actually to Island Health executives in the last three weeks and said, we need to up the number of beds. So we're looking forward to seeing where that goes. Well, that's an understatement that we need to up the number of beds. So you can quote 39 or so south of Malahat and nine north of the Malahat. Whereas we know that our population north of the Malahat has surpassed that of south there or that of the south of Malahat population um, by some thousands of people. So that's really concerning. Dr. Wiggers, you mentioned, of course, that you, the system in your view has been, you know, uh, simply overtaxed. I want to acknowledge, um, I sit on the, on the uh, Nanaimo Homeless Coalition, have for about two years now, and I'm also on the Mayor's Task Force on, on Health and Housing. So I have a great deal of awareness about our homeless population and uh, the threat that they're under. I think it's remarkable, and we've been remarkably lucky that the pandemic has not touched that population in ways that it could have, which would have created pure havoc for our system. Um, but now that we're coming um, out of it in, in a number of ways, you've pointed out that we're going to get a second wave of mental health issues approaches. Do you want to expand on that just a little bit? Uh, in discussions this week with the Nanaimo Brain Injury Society and their executive director pointed out to me in conversation, that they estimate about half the population of homeless uh, are, are suffering from some form of brain injury. Those are a lot of different topics. Um, um, so the original question was, what, how did I feel about Nanaimo being chosen as a COVID uh, cohort site? And uh, um, that got me sort of thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, I, I actually see a great advantage for me, knowing that our clients, our mental health clients, are in close proximity to the ICU beds and the intensive care that's required gives me a lot of consolation because the truth is that the mental health clients are particularly vulnerable, both in terms of, like you say, the difficulty if they're unsheltered or the impossibility to socially distance increases the likelihood of exposure, but more pointedly, they all have comorbidities. Most all of them have uh, physical as well as mental conditions. So um, the probability is much higher. And, and this actually is some of the literature coming out of China, the, the original published data that the mental health clients are disproportionately 
um, affected by COVID. So we sort of anticipate that any of the clients that get COVID would probably escalate quickly. We don't know for sure. And we have a lot of uh, contingency plans, as you were sort of alluding to ways to assist with social isolation for an unsheltered person, uh, ways to uh, protect them. But there's the idea that we would um, quickly be leaning on the medical COVID cohort sites at NRGH. And it's advantageous not to have to transport clients with COVID positive status up and down the island. So I think it's to an advantage to, to our mental health uh, population. But I would add that I do think that there is a second COVID, COVID positive site proposed at COMOX for the mild, for the mental health clients. And, and we don't currently have any plans that I'm aware of, although we discuss it, but a, a, a mental health specific COVID unit. At this point, it's going to be managed with, with the medical uh, in the hospital. So I, I think that's most of, the, uh, most of the questions you proposed to me. I can't remember. <laughs> I, think, I think you did a good job of blending that into a, to your answer. Okay, good. Um, how, how do we look after our own? What's the best method or best measures that we can take personally, individually to look after our, our own mental health? And maybe if there are some preventative measures to make sure that things don't get out of hand. Um, any tips there, Dr. Wiggers? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so, so, like I was talking about fear. So, I just think that management of anxiety and fear is central to this whole thing. There's lots you can do, but the, the bottom line, I think, is developing resiliency. And we all have a certain God-gifted amount, a genetically endowed amount of resiliency. Some of us bounce through things more easily than others. Um, but all of us can benefit from uh, developing resiliency. So there's no question that some of the things that are very obvious, like building community and, uh, and reducing isolation. So obviously that's just a challenge with, with what, our, what we're being asked to do, but as much as you can stay in touch with other people, all the messaging that you've been hearing I, I completely um, is supported by what I understand in the psychiatric literature. Isolation is a killer. Isolation causes depression. Breaking through isolation reverses that process. So I think that's important. Any kind of a, a stress reducing activity such as mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, exercise, uh, listening to music, all that stuff is, is super, um, well, not to overstate it, but super helpful. <laughs> um, I think uh, diet, I think there's certainly good solid ground to advising Basic healthcare, like eat well, sleep well, don't use drugs and alcohol as much as is possible, reduce drugs and alcohol as much as is possible. And again, in, in my, my peeps, the people that I worry about, they struggle, right? The comorbidity of mental health and addiction is very high. So as we see the second wave, there's going to be a wave, I predict, I don't know for sure, but I would think increased problems of alcoholism, cannabis use as people try to cope. Um, and so that's kind of a challenge, right? We would really want to encourage people to refrain from turning to substances and, and turning instead to these other things I mentioned to, to support our mental health. Um, so I think that's the generalities. I think you mentioned some good websites. I, I have sort of suggested anxietycanada.com. That's uh, BC uh, um, Anxiety Society. It's basically a, um, uh, I would say it's government funded, but it's sort of a nationally recognized. It's supported by the uh, um, UBC and you know the, the province as a good source of information, a good source of truth for management of anxiety. And they have a special section for dealing with COVID. So. So, so bounce back what you said, anxietycanada.com. Those are two great places to go. And then, of course, BC, bccdc.org is a great source of truth as well. There are some pretty simple tips, just the mindfulness, uh, the self-awareness, 
social, maintain social connections, get outdoors, which, you know, is especially health, healthy right now because it is so outstandingly beautiful uh, right now this time of year. So we're really fortunate where we are. Um, Dr. Copeland, I wonder if you uh, might want to address the five-year plan for the hospital. We're coming out of this. Our, our hospital was in good shape. I know I was in just for some regular tests a couple of weeks ago, and it was eerily quiet in the building and, and in the surrounding, uh, in the parking lot and everything was it's a little bit odd, but um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit uh, about uh, what the situation is now and where we're going with the growth of the hospital and the facilities there. Yeah, thanks. First, I, I just wanna say uh, with, with COVID, I mean, everything else kind of got shifted to the side and, and rightfully so, of course. Uh, obviously we were providing care as patients came into the hospital that they needed and we encouraged them to come if they were sick. But uh, we, we had kind of put everything else on the back burner uh, uh, because of the COVID situation. And really with COVID, it's learning as you go. Um, I mean, as, as Yara said, initially we wanted to cohort everyone in the two hospitals and now milder cases were thinking, well, they can stay more in their community. So, and, and just before I move on to the five-year plan, your comments about the eerie quiet in the hospital. I mean, obviously visitors can't come as much and we're recommending, you know, if, you're, if you don't have to be there, you, you shouldn't be. But tying it into the stress, I mean, the medical staff had a huge learning curve to ramp up for this because uh, we were one of the COVID sites and that involved changing all our procedures in every area, medical imaging for me, surgery, emergency, on the wards. How do you isolate these people? How do you not get infected? How do you not spread infection? How do you wear the PPE, the protective, that's the personal protective equipment, the gowns, the gloves, the masks that we all know that we were, every, the world was caught short, not just us. Uh, and they're very stressful that you don't have it, you don't, or do you have enough? Uh, how do you deal with a patient who comes in with a cough and emerge? That, this level of stress that I saw in the hospital, it, there, it was, you know, you could tell people were stressed out. They, they did their jobs amazingly well and very professionally, and, but there was a lot of stress. And I think now people are a bit more comfortable six weeks into this. They're all trained in, in much, you know, in the PPE and, you know, uh, not spreading infection, infectious procedures and we have had several patients in now and we've moved them through properly from eMERGE to the ward and out again. So the stress level I'd say is down from a medical health personnel in the hospital compared to what it was. Of course, we're never gonna go back to business as usual though and that's the next phase we're on to is preparing for what happens, uh, a second wave of COVID. Well, I'll talk about that after, but with regards to the five-year plan, uh, what this really did was, you know, we have made some gains, GI is coming, we're getting an ICU, but what this really, our number one priority, which has been the number one priority for about the last year, was high acuity unit beds. And for people who don't know what these are, these are for people that are really sick, but don't require to be intubated in an ICU, the people with heart attacks, strokes, uh, uh, what's hypotension, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, any serious infections and things like that. They need to be looked after by critical care nurses and doctors, and we don't have any of those beds in Nanaimo. And so we've been focusing on that. And what COVID has actually shone the lens right on that, that we really are, you know, that's, that's a, a gap that we need to fill in our hospital for, not for just Nanaimo patients, just for the whole up island. These beds would be used by by potentially people from all over as the COVID site we were designated. And we actually have developed a, a sort of mini high acuity unit for COVID patients. That's, they, they developed that in, it's in the emergency and we're hoping that we can transition that into a high acuity unit with the help of Island Health and the ministry. And as I mentioned, the ministry has approached us. So there are many other priorities, as you know, cardiology and, and GI will be moving back to the forefront, but really the focus right now is on these high acuity unit beds because, you know, uh, and it, it, COVID has helped shine the focus on the, the fact that we were not adequately resourced in that. And, and to their credit, the ministry is reaching out to us. So hopefully that will, you know, that's something we desperately need because you, you really have to be able to look after your most ill patients uh, as a hospital. That's your first mission. People that are really sick need the proper care. And so we need those beds. 
Uh, we uh, <clears throat> woke up to the news this morning that after yesterday's announcements, uh, what's uh, on the front pages of our daily papers is the fact that um, there's uh, thousands of surgeries uh, that were that were delayed, <clears throat> and what our health minister has stated is that it could take as long as 18 to 24 months uh, to get caught up on that. And uh, looking at a cost of, a, of around $250 million for year one of doing that catch up. Can you comment on that, uh, Dr. Copeland? Sure. Yeah, actually, I was just in, in a meeting yesterday where they're talking about that. And uh, there is going to be a ma ma major ramp up of elective surgeries in the next two months. Uh, we are starting to do elective surgeries, I believe, next week in Nanaimo. And it will be gradual because recognize we have the procedures have changed totally for most, not for all surgeries. Or, and for some of the surgeries, actually, it'll be standard of care because they already use sterile precautions in the ORs. But for many of these, they're going to have to take extra precautions. And so it's, you know, the new procedures are in and they've been working with them for a while. So we should be able to get back to regular levels. They're hoping in a month. And then after a month, there is they are going to actually start doing elective surgeries in the evenings and on weekends all through the summer. So the, it, that there is going to be, that is going to generate a huge amount of, uh, you know, capacity. Uh, it, you know, the surgeons will be working a lot. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, obviously the, the bed counts in the hospital will go up, but uh, you know, we, we've got to get on with it. So, so that we're looking forward to that. And that's the same as a radiologist medical imaging will follow that. Uh, we're going to start ramping up too. And as a, our reality won't be the same. We're going to have to figure out how to do this and not have 25 people in, a, in each of these waiting rooms. We're going to only be able to have three or four. So, but that's, that's the challenges coming up and, and they'll be coming fast. That's going to happen all in the next couple of weeks and we'll be ramped right up and, and we'll probably be going late into the evenings in medical imaging with everything too, to try to catch up. You know, what you're describing <clears throat> sounds to me like a, a real shift in our healthcare system um, has arisen because of this experience with the pandemic. It, am I right in thinking that? To, you know, I read that we're looking to hire 400 uh, nurses uh, for the system, um, and that would be bringing back uh, semi-retired nurses, I guess, and uh, nurses who are on leave or sabbaticals or whatever. Um, can you comment on that? It just, it's, it's what you're describing sounds to me like, you know, we're turning a corner here <clears throat> we're changing our healthcare system and, um, and better things are going to come out of this. I'll comment then. I, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Wigger too, because I'm sure he's seen the changes. Yeah. Some, uh, Island health. And we've just had many discussions with this, uh, with the senior administration there in the last couple of weeks, what can we capture out of this? That's good for our system. And one of the things we've seen is virtual care. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously you want that patient contact and to put hands on, but it's, it's been very, we realized how efficient virtual care can be and how effective in, in a pandemic like this. And, and just the whole uh, business will, is going to be different. It, it will be different for everyone. Like medical imaging, you know, we're no, as I said, we're no longer going to have 25 people in our waiting rooms with stretchers of ill patients going by. What were we, th you know what I mean? Like that is going to change forever and that will be good. Mm -hmm. There'll be less infection spreading. You know, uh, our staff will be better protected. The patients will be better protected. Uh, and, and there's a whole, you know, we're, we're going to have to get used to it. We're going to, you know, hand washing, social distancing, um, barriers, in grocery stores, uh, in the hospital, when you come into your, the, pro, the medical offices like Dr. Wiggers and mask, query, you know, cloth mask, whatever, that's going to be a reality that's going to go forward with us. And, and we're going to have to have to look at that. And, and, and various other things are being looked at. You're exactly right. What can we take from this and improve our system, make it more effective? We got our hospital bed counts down to about 70% during this. And elective surgery usually accounts for about 15%. So we were, we were down below census. We're never like that. What did we do that allowed that? Now, that may not be a reality. We can keep up. But we're looking at all kinds of things along those lines to say, what works better here? What should we take out of this? So there'll be lots of lessons learned. We're just starting to, 
to look at those seriously now. So Dr. Wiggers, how have those same things affected you and your department in psychiatry? I, I imagine that, um, that that wing of the hospital was pretty busy to begin with. Um, what's happened over the past 60 days? And as you say, you're, in, you're expecting sort of a second wave of mental health issues to come, to come forward now. So can you comment on, on the capacity uh, to deal with this and just your experience all around that psychiatric uh, wing? Sure, thank you. Um, so I've been really enjoying the kinds of conversations that have been uh, uh, evolving over the last four to six weeks. And um, one of the things that's clear to me that's uh, changed and will forever, I think, be a, a very positive memory is how much we came together and how much, at least in the mental health substance use community, how much we have learned about the importance of uh, regular check-ins and regular dialogue. And when you come together around a common purpose, it's, it's phenomenal. We're all the silos and the turf and all the tension sort of just kind of fades away because you're all in it together. And I, I think that, that it's my sincerest hope that we can carry that forward and, and continue to work together for a common purpose. So that, that's been a real common theme, and especially in the last couple of weeks, sort of now that we kind of look back a little bit to see where we've come from, there's a real recognition of, of, of that wonderful shift in our culture. We, I, I would say for in the nylon health community, we've, we've always been tight-knit and we've worked well together, but it's just taken it to the next level. Um, what uh, David said about virtual care is, uh, I don't want to overstate it, but I, I think it's, it's a disruptive technology. It is completely changing uh, how we've done business in the last six weeks and is completely designed for the future. Um, I, I think I've read it that um, COVID has moved us forward 10 years in the span of two weeks. We've been talking about virtual care and it's been popping up here and there for years and years. I, I've been involved with it for at least six, but now it's here and our health authority is totally on board. We have a platform that we'll be using. And so uh, as, as um, we anticipate Dr. Henry's official blessing that we can start to move to phase two and they anticipate uh, opening up. One of them will be the permission to do face-to-face -face office based counseling again. So that's going to be a major um, return to business as usual, perhaps. I think a lot of my colleagues are actually preferring to stay on board with virtual care and, and I will be too. I, I really find it uh, extremely useful in, in the mental health arena because you don't have to actually do a physical examination and um, ironically in some ways it's better suited than in-person care not not totally but in some ways and in particular the depressed anxious shut-in agoraphobic panicky people love it that we call them at home so I think this is going to be a total uh, step forward um, and and in a way, something positive out of COVID. Um, and then what David said earlier, I think just the increased awareness of infection control and uh, appreciating the importance of social responsibility. I, I really hope that that continues forward. Um, so in terms of just, so that's a personal comments, in terms of like the health authority, um, our capacity, like I said, it lulled for about a couple weeks. Um, but we're, we're over capacity in Victoria and in Nanaimo again, and our, we're back to, you know, people in the psychiatric emergency service and uh, over census in the inpatient unit. Um, so I don't, I don't think that um, for as much as the hospital seems eerily quiet to you, it's not so <laughs> inside psychiatry. We're, we're, we're working very hard. And that extra layer of, of anxiety around um, social distancing is a particularly challenge with our clients because quite frankly if you're if you're emotionally disturbed or troubled or traumatized or worse psychotic or manic it is it's it's really impossible to to 
to even be aware of social space. So we've had a lot of extra, uh, um, uh, what's the word I would look for? Requirements or contingencies or, or uh, structural changes in how we treat our, our clients in the hospital to ensure and protect them from uh, inadvertent spread. It, it, it's my personal, um, as a medical lead, I guess my, my, one of my goals is to prevent an outbreak uh, on a psychiatric unit. And, and we are more vulnerable. The other area would be the dementia patients, but we have a lot of those as well. So, so I think that's going forward, as David said, there's going to be this increased uh, awareness and attention to uh, our clients in, in protecting them from inadvertent spread of uh, COVID. So, and I don't think that's going to go away till like, I think phase four is business as usual. I guess that's after the vaccine. Who knows? Mm. Anyway, those are some comments. I wonder, a comment from both of you, maybe uh, Dr. Wiggers, you can take a lead on this first, is that our demographics here on the island and especially in the mid-island are such that we have a bit of a barbell going on. We have a, a heavy weight of, of seniors. Um, retirees, semi-retirees, and, and and real seniors. And then we have a, a, a bit of a, a blip on the other end of the scale, which is the young families uh, uh, who who are, have been recently moving here from other other places in Canada. How is that demographic, uh, how is that reflected in both in COVID patients, in healthcare in general, and in psychiatric care? Do you want to start yours? Sure. Well, um, I'm, I'm adjusting my seat because that's a huge question. Um, I think the demographic that we all worry about is, is the, uh, the boomers and the aging boomers that are, are settling here, but of course are just arising all across North America. Um, I think psychiatry blurs quite quickly with geriatric medicine and old age psychiatry and geriatric medicine are really basically sharing the burden of dementia. And as that continues to um, climb, I, I don't, I'm not a geriatrician or a geriatric psychiatrist. So I don't readily have the percentages, but my general sense is that we're seeing a rise of uh, that population. And so that's absolutely tying into all of the concerns about COVID and long-term care. So the health authority um, continues to prioritize uh, partnerships with as many long-term care facilities as possible. And um, uh, the um, expectation will be greater and greater utilization of uh, mental health services for that population. Um, I'm not in a position, I guess, to really elaborate on that much more, but I do know that MHSU or Mental Health Substance Use Division of the Health Authority um, is, is very keen on how to build capacity for the long-term uh, care of geriatric patients with dementia and, and comorbid mental illnesses, or even just the mental illnesses as a result of dementia. So it's a major challenge. The other actually, end of the demographic, the young families, I, I guess I'm not super worried about them, sort of that's kind of my demographic, I guess. Um, well, not so young, but anyways. But it's, it's the um, persistence of Nanaimo still as a destination site because of our, I don't even know why, but we just have a huge amount of homeless, addicted, low socioeconomically disadvantaged people here as well. And I, I think that's the other part of the barbell myself. There's the, the established influx of the geriatric well healed to a degree, but then I think we have this other demographic that, that I'm, those, that's what I said earlier, those are my people, those are the people that I worry about and they are um, a major source of attention for the health authority, as I said earlier. So, and with the COVID thing, I think it's just gonna continue to um, uh, inspire and drive us forward to continue to provide universal access to healthcare. I, I really think it's a human right for everybody and that demographic is no less entitled. 
I would agree, and especially especially need um, needy in the area of mental health. Doctor uh, Copeland, do you want to re remark on the the demographics of our uh, community and how that impacts uh, our needs for health care and our expense of delivering expense in delivering health care? Yeah, uh, well, Yoris, I'm sorry, you have to be qualified as young. Sorry, uh, and I, I'm a boomer, so I, I I know I know where we're at here, but. Uh, no, uh, we have the oldest population in Canada in Central Island. And as we all know, you use most of your resources in healthcare in your last five years. So the demand is, and we're growing, the North Island's growing faster than the South Island. So you can, the, the implications for resources is significant um, and uh, it's not gonna go away. Uh, and, and just to, to touch on the, the five-year plan, mental health, uh, is the number two priority on uh, the five-year plan. And it's a, uh, we definitely need uh, people like yours to tackle our significant issues in that regard, both for the younger population and for the older. Uh, and I think he framed it well, uh, the discussion around that. Uh, so from, you know, uh, we have services we need as we get older and uh, you know, they're in the five-year plan such as cardiac and cancer. They're the most prominent issues and uh, those are in the five-year plan and, we, and, and we're looking to, and we're working with Island Health to uh, you know, execute the plan and, and get the resources and the services uh, that we need for, uh, for our, our aging population. Um, those are the two biggest ones. Well, it's, uh, really medical services, acute internal medical services, neurology, and we've had success and we've got uh, three neurologists now, or well, two and a third one coming and two more planned. So we're gonna have five neurologists. So uh, medical services, cancer services, that's, that's what we need more of with that aging population and mental health services, quite frankly. We do have some, there are some surgical service needs uh, with an aging population, obviously. Uh, really there's, we have, uh, a couple of things identified. One of them is uh, vascular surgery, which uh, is something probably the population up here age at a game needs, and that's on the five-year plan as well. So, uh, so definitely we have uh, a lot of need, and uh, you know we're working. And Island Health is aware of it; they acknowledge it. And we're working with them, trying to get the you know the ministry on side, who is well aware of it as well, and they're they're uh, they're certainly coming to the table that we can we can get the resources that our population needs, both young and old. I just want to comment briefly about the hospital because uh, it is eerily quiet, but uh, it's very busy in the merge. The, the levels are almost up to normal. And it's interesting because you speak to the merge doc, the people coming in are really sick. Uh, and I think a lot of people have been staying away from the hospital as you said early, and a lot of people are getting sick. And so the I've been, you know, working in radiology the last few days, and it's been extremely busy, as busy as normal, you know, uh, from an eMERGE point of view. And that's a reflection of the significant, uh, you know, medical burden we, we have out there. And it's just been different in the hospital. We're, and, and talk to the eMERGE docs, these people are really sick. They're seeing, they said on average, the people are sicker than are coming in uh, because they, they don't really want to come to the hospital now with potential COVID. So, uh, and we've seen that on the demand and imaging and, and the inpatients. So uh, although the bed count was down, it's now crept up to almost 90%. Uh, yeah, it, it's not, you know, we're, we're still going to have these demands and they will get back fairly quickly, I think, once people are, you know, they're just getting sick, they're coming in now. So, uh, but it is in the hospital, it, it's been quite nice to, to deal with these very acute situations and it's been quiet and calm. And like I say, the, 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 the doctors, nurses, and, and staff have all been very professional because don't forget the staff, our clerical staff, cleaning staff, they're exposed to this as much as anyone. And they've been terrific, you know, in, in, in doing their jobs. So the hospital is certainly there and, and open for business and it's safe to go there. So. Right. Do you want to say um, a few words to, to uh, begin wrap up, uh, Dr. Wiggers? Sure. Um, maybe an opportunity to, I had, I had failed to mention that part of our response is to develop resources. And so we're actively trying to recruit for psychiatry. We have a psychiatric 
You reminded me, Dave, when you said that you need more people like me, and I realized we definitely need lots more psychiatrists. So we are recruiting hard, and we're actually doing two innovations as well that have come up from COVID. One is to partner with psychiatrists in other parts of the province that may not be as busy as we are, and to provide virtual care. So that's an initiative that's uh, currently being considered at the highest level and hopefully we'll get a word back uh, next week. And the other is that we've recruited temporarily, and I think the initiative is to try and build GP specialists. So GPs that have an interest in mental health services that can work uh, and provide uh, outpatient care. Um, we haven't worked on an inpatient model, but for sure an outpatient model. So building capacity is a huge part of our, our uh, plan for the future. Um, so my closing comment is just that um, a bit more global statements, if you can bear with me here. So that I've, I've been reflecting on pandemics in history, and I think that there's, there's this idea that I think is being thrown around, which I totally subscribe to, which is that pandemics shape history, and that pandemics change the social fabric of, of a society or a globe that gets hit. So... I think that we really are looking at a, a new normal and I, I'm an optimist. I, I have to say as much as very, very sadly, we'll have to acknowledge we've lost people and we will continue to lose people in the pandemic. I think the vast majority of us, if you look at the stats, the vast majority of us will survive this. And as a species, I think we're gonna move forward to, I think a better era. and. As David said, this has laid bare what our, our system is like and where the cracks are, and we're shoring them up. We're working quickly to, to, to make it a better system, and I think that system going forward is, is going to be, like I said, with a lot of virtual care and a lot more infection awareness and better delivery of services. And I would just conclude that don't forget my peeps. Like there are a lot of people out there that uh, um, struggle and for your listeners who've not liked feeling isolated for six weeks and feeling lonely, when you've got mental illness, that's what your life is like. And a little bit of compassion. So thank you really for giving me the opportunity to speak on their behalf today. And I, I thank you for bringing that forward, especially uh, I know with my work downtown and with the population of Street and Trench that we work with and try to assist and, and support, it's, uh, it's hyper challenging. It's so difficult. And uh, somebody said to me the other day, I can't wait for the new normal because the old normal kind of sucked. <laughs> and I kind of yeah. missed that and said, yeah, you're pretty bang on there. Dr. Copeland, uh, any words in closing from you, yeah. sir? Just, uh, I think that I, I totally agree with yours that we are into a new normal and I think it will be a better new normal eventually. And, uh, and that's look for the second thing I, I just want to say closing. Thanks for the opportunity. Prepare for a second wave. Uh, that's what we are doing right now at the hospital and, and, uh, at a senior level, you know, and that means protecting the most vulnerable the long-term care patients, the, the patients that URS has talked about, we really need to make sure they're protected because we probably won't close everything down this time. Uh, and, you know, for us, it means having adequate uh, PPE for everyone out in the community as well. People who have to go into long-term care facilities, people work there. So securing enough of that, planning for ramping up surgeries and everything and doing it safely. And, and, and I think people, the public has to recognize we're you know, we're going to still be asking them to social distance, mask, wash hands, and barriers as appropriate. And we'll get through it, and we will have a better, a, a, new, a better new day on the horizon. So thank you. For sure. <clears throat> Thanks to both of you. I, I meant to open, as I do uh, most meetings that I attend, and, uh, and talk to Dr. Wiggers about this briefly. Um, but acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, and for, in our case here in the Nanaimo area, that means the Nanaimo, uh, Saminas and Sanas uh, uh, nations. Um, we pay our respect to and thank them for uh, such a lovely place to live, work, and play. 
Um, to both of you, thanks uh, uh, to you uh, personally for doing this, but thanks also an extended thanks to your staff and your support teams there in the healthcare system. These are the folks that were banging the pots and pans and you know ringing bells for and playing trumpets off the balconies at uh, seven o'clock every night. And it's just wonderful to see the community come together to do stuff like that and, and show that they care about the people who care for them and keep, uh, keep us safe and healthy. So uh, in closing, thank you both very much. Thank you to our viewers today. This is recorded and is available on our website minutes after we get off air. Um, next week, we'll continue next Friday morning, uh, looking at two major components of our economy, that's construction and development. Rory Kamala, who is the CEO of the Vancouver Island Construction Association, and Carrie Ann Cody from the uh, Canadian Home Builders Association will be joining us here at 10 a.m. next Friday. Thanks, folks, and our moderator is going to take us offline now, and I may lose the good doctors, or I may keep them. We're going to find out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy. Stay strong.